So uh, this is going to be the last lecture from the physiology, which is regarding the cerebral blood flow, cerebral spinal fluid, and brain metabolism. If you look at how much amount of blood flow reaches the brain, these are the units given in the title physiology. That around 50 to 65 ml reaches per gram, per 100 gram of brain tissue in a minute. So if you talk about the entire brain, then around 750 to 900 ml of blood reaches the entire brain in a minute. This makes about 15% of the rest of our body. If you look at the weight of the brain in our body as an organ, it constitutes around 2% of our entire body weight, right? So, and that 2% of the body weight is getting around 15% of the body fat. And that's a significant amount as compared to its weight. Right, so what are the, what is the blood supply? How is it reaching the brain? It is, it enters by two important vessels. Four total in number, two pairs. Two carotid arteries, which give off the more significant blood supply, and two vertebral arteries. Yes, these are the input sources of blood into the brain, between carotids, to be specific, with the internal carotids, and two vertebral arteries, right? So two carotids on the blue sides and different vertebral arteries. These will rise up from the base of the brain and they form a very important circle of wellness. Okay? The two vertebral arteries on the back side and the two uh, cerebral uh, sorry, vertebral arteries and different carotid arteries will form a circle of bilis at the base of the brain. From this, then originate pile arteries, which will flow along the base of the brain and then finally turn into penetrating artery, which penetrates into the substance of the brain. This is how the intracerebral pelvis look like. There are extremely tight junctions between the endothelial layer, extremely tight junctions, and then superimposed, they are supporting cells, okay? uh, supporting cells known as astrocytes. They function as glial or supporting cells and provide nutrition to the neurons. They also surround the blood vessels. Hence, the capillaries within the brain, there are these because the tight junctions as well as the two processes of the exercise. Now let's talk about how the blood flow is regulated once we now know how it has entered the brain. How is the cerebral blood flow regulated? These are the different factors which control the cerebral blood flow, which include number one, the intracranial pressure. Pressure within the intracranium, whether it's the pressure of the brain tissue. Okay, for example, uh, this pressure increases during the uh, brain edema, or whether it's the cerebrospinal fluid pressure. Okay, all of these pressures, if increased, will compress the pupillaries, the cerebral pupillaries, hence decreasing the blood flow. Other than this, there could be local constrictive or dilatory factors which can contribute to the cerebral blood flow. The mean arterial pressure. The systemic pressure, okay, if that is high, that can uh, alter the blood flow to the brain. Viscosity, thickness of the blood, and last but not the least, the mean venous pressure at the exit level of the brain. All these factors contribute to the cerebral blood flow. What are the factors which contribute to the regulation? There are four factors listed in the title. Starting off from number one, the carbon dioxide concentration. When the level of carbon dioxide it rises in the brain. We know the usual process of it, uh, it by it, I mean carbon dioxide reacting with water to form carbonic acid, which further dissociates into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. Now, this hydrogen ion, or if hydrogen ion rises to any other cause, for example, uh, if level of other acid they rise in the brain, for example, uh, lactic acid accumulation in the air, yeah, pyruvic acid levels rise in the brain, and the end basically it's the hydrogen ion concentration that is rising. This hydrogen ion concentration basically, what will happen if it accumulates in the brain? It will decrease the neuron activity. We have studied this before that acidity decreases the neuron activity. So it's very important that hydrogen ion will cause vasodilation dilation of the cerebral capillaries, leading to increase cerebral blood flow. And the reason being that this increased blood flow will basically wash away the hydrogen ions so that the neuron activity is maintained and the Third factor which contributes to regulation of the cerebral blood flow is oxygen concentration. The normal amount, normal value of oxygen concentration within the brain is 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. Fall below 30 will cause vasodilation. Hence, it's a protective mechanism. Which the 
brain is using oxygen readily, right? Cessation of blood flow for about five to ten seconds can lead to unconsciousness. So the, the person will collapse without oxygen for just five to six, uh, ten seconds. Right. Fourth factor uh, which contributes to cerebral blood flow is the substances released back in sources. Now I've mentioned before these green cells that you can see are astrocytes. These are glyes or supporting cells which provide nutrients to the neurons and they give off foot processes which encircle the nucleus. These uh, astrocytes, they release on stimulation by the neurons. Okay? They have communication with the neurons and they communicate on one end by the nucleus. So if the neurons are excited, they release glutamate at their ends. This glutaminergic neuron would stimulate the astrocyte to cause increased calcium ion concentration in the astrocytes which causes release of vasoactive metabolites. What would be these vasoactive metabolites? It's still being studied. Examples could be nitric oxide, potassium ions, adenosine, uh, metabolites, and metabolites. All of this is to vasodilation. Then there is a phenomenon of autoregulation going on despite systemic blood pressure changes between the range of 60 and 140. The cerebral blood flow remains constant. That's a very important detective mechanism of autoregulation between the cerebral blood flow remaining constant between the range of mean arterial pressure of 60 to 140 and even beyond in hyperventilation. Uh, another important point is the role of sympathetic nervous system. That also protects small muscles. How? Sympathetic stimulation occurs during strength exercise, for example, okay, or extreme excitement. Yeah, so whenever there is sympathetic stimulation due to any reason, what happens is this causes vasoconstriction of the large vessels and the intermediate vessels. Okay, the large vessels, the large arterioles, and the intermediate size arterioles they vasoconstrict. Hence, it controls or limits the amount of increased blood pressure, blood flowing into the smaller vessels, hence preventing their dilation or their um, rupture, hence preventing stroke, hemorrhage, okay? So that your system protects the smaller vessel by vasoconstriction of the large and the intermediate sized arterials, hence the blood flow to the small vessel that is regulated in normal levels, preventing hemorrhage and stroke. Now let's talk about the cerebral spinal fluid. Where is it it's found? Yeah, it is found within the brain in these ventricles. These are called the spaces within the brain. Ventricles in which they are found and are actually uh, the cause of production. Okay. The ventricles uh, are lined by choroidal plexus, which release cerebral spinal fluid, which will then flow among the foramina when communicate between the ventricles and will finally go into the cisterna, then mass pulmonaries in the cerebral body. So let's talk about the ventricles. There are four ventricles in number, two ventricles. This is one ventricle, and then the blurred out is the ventricle on the opposite side, the opposite cholesterol. This is the frontal pole or interior part of the ventricle, the right ventricle. This will be the inferior yeah. or the temporal one. This is the posterior or the occipital one. Okay, all these are the ones of the single lateral ventricle. Lateral ventricle then drains the CSL via the foramen of one row into the third ventricle. This is the third ventricle which lies in the center. It's one and under. Okay, this is the third ventricle. The junction between the third and the lateral ventricle is foramen of one row. Third ventricle will finally drain its CSA into the fourth ventricle. This triangle initially is the fourth ventricle. And the communication between the third and the fourth ventricle is via the aqueduct of signals. CSA will find drain, finally drain from the lateral, sorry, the fourth ventricle into the cisterna magna via three parameters. Three numbers. There are two lateral and one line. Medial, medial one is known as foramen congenital. And the two lateral ones are called foramen of flush. flush they all these three will drain into the cisterna magna, which will then drain into the subarachnoid space. The, this blue, this is a better one. Space, okay? so these are the choroidal plexus which lines the ventricles. The lateral ventricle will drain into the third ventricle via the foramen of Monroe, 
the foramen of uh, sorry, the third ventricle will then drain into the fourth ventricle via the aqueduct of Sylvius. Foramen of one goes the CSF will drain into the cisterna magnum. The cisterna magnum. Via foramen of magenta in the midline and in lateral foramen as well, which are uh, not so uh, sorry, this these are the lateral virtues. The two lateral virtues are uh, known as foramen of Bashka, for median foramen, known as foramen of magenta. All of these three remain in the sister and magna. So say the CSF will then flow around the cerebellum and end it into the subarachnoid space. This is the cerebellum space. Let's follow the arrows. From subarachnoid space, the CSF finally enters the sagittal sinuses via the arachnoidal granulations on the villi. Give us one little outfit. Finally, there are perivascular spaces. Uh, we talked about the circle of Willis. The circle of Willis gives off pile arteries. These pile arteries will finally penetrate the drain tissue. Hence, these arteries those are then called penetrating arteries and then give off intracerebral arteries. When these penetrating arteries penetrate the brain tissue, they take along with them the subarachnoid space and the pile matter. Pile matter is this in blue. Parameter is the is in direct contact with the brain. So part of that enters the along with the penetrative arteries. Now look at around the penetrative arteries, there is a space known as the perivascular space. This basically acts as the lymphatics. The brain never has two lymphatics along with it, but the perivascular space basically acts as lymphatic drainage because it uh, transports fluid, which extravasates the vessel, proteins, and different kinds of information. All this. Drains into the perivascular space, which will then enter into the subarachnoid space and will be drained out into the sinuses later on. We talk about the total amount of excess cellular fluid found within the central nervous system. Uh, its total volume is around 420 ml. All of the fluid which lies outside the brain cells is basically 420 ml in volume. Out of this 420, 140 or 150 ml is cerebrospinal fluid. Rest of the remaining and look, it's more and more. That is basically the interstitial fluid that we find from the B in the brain cells inside the pile. So 140 or 150 ml is cerebrospinal fluid, out of which is mason, those from the ventricles, and the rest of it is from the cerebral space. Okay, now let's quickly talk about the blood brain barrier, the barrier which is between the brain tissue and the blood, and the blood CSF barrier. The Barrier which is between the cerebral spinal fluid and the blood. Uh, this is the blood brain barrier. So, okay, we've seen this picture before. They, it consists of tight junction which are present between the endothelial cells plus the extracellular blood processes. So, these are extremely tight junctions between the endothelial cells. Here is where the blood will be. This is the basal lamina. And finally, there are fit processes of the astrocytes which encircle the communities, hence, making it extremely least. Then, let's talk about the blood and CSF barrier. When the cerebral spinal fluid is formed from the choroidal plexus, this is choroidal epithelium. There are again tight junctions between the choroidal cells of the choroidal plexus. These are the choroidal cells, two choroidal cells of the choroidal epithelium, which will produce cerebral spinal fluid, and there are tight junctions between them. And hence, there's no mixing of blood and cells. No blood in the brain tissue. Volume 140 or 140 ml, uh, 150 ml of CSF is present. Basic function of CSF is to push in the brain. It's the protective function. It is secreted by the choroidal plexus, which lines the ventricles and mainly the lateral ventricles. And finally, it is absorbed at the end by the arachnoidal villi, which project from the spectral space. The surgical sinus very uh, frequently or commonly asked in surgeons what is spinal fluid. If we compare the surgical spinal fluid with the blood, then this list it gives us chemicals which are same in concentration. Same concentration in the CSF is that of blood. What are some of the ions? Sodium chloride bicarbonate. These the concentration of these ions is similar, it's exactly equal in CSF and that in play and in the blood. And hence the osmolarity because these are the main regulatory ions for osmolarity and hence the osmotic pressure it is equal on both sides. Now let's talk about the substances which are less in the CSF and more in the blood. Potassium ions, more in the blood. Potassium ions, glucose, amino acids. These uh, are found less in the CSF and more in the blood. 
Hence, the, even the pH, the acidity of the bypass protein and the CSH, uh, all the store on uh, proteins. And these are all the substances which are found in protein and blood in the CSH. The exception of two things which are more than the CSH, are so that the blood is magnesium and anthracnin. Only these two things are the rest of the chemicals and more in the CSH. Then let's talk about how the CSH is being protective. It will the brain is basically floating within the surface by the virus is flowed because the specific gravity of the brain and the CSH is almost equal. Yes, it does not sink. In the CSF, it will rise in the CSF, but it's true somewhere in the brain. Weight is about 1400 grams, but when it's suspended in the CSF, it weighs only hence because it's floating in nature. Uh, two important chemical pictures are shown counterpoint and food injury. Okay, whenever something strikes or there is a severe blow to the head, the point of impact, if the brain is injured at the site of impact, we call it food injury. Food is basically the primary impact. What happens is, for example, this is raw. Okay, and someone you know, gives you a square blow in the front of the head. What happens is that the head or the skull, it can move posteriorly to the back. The brain towards, because of its inertia, it will stay for a fraction of a second, split second delay, it will stay there and then. But the head moves backward. Due to this, there is a slight creation of vacuum at the back. So after a fraction of a second, if you fill that vacuum, now the brain will move back and would strike the posterior surface. Due to this collision, now if the brain suffers injury, this will be known as counterproductive injury. Okay? This occurs on the opposite side of the impact. Examples of poop and counterproductive injury is shaking baby syndrome. If someone shakes a baby to and fro, this can be the poop as well as the of injury, and it's a very common form of injury in both of them. Clinical picture, clinical power of the CSF picture is important. This is how a normal um, outlook of a spinal tap gives off. What is a spinal tap? Also known as a number function. Number function, it is where the spinal cord basically ends. The corda ipana, the tailing end of the spinal cord ends. You basically insert a spinal needle at the site of number spines and towards the base one of the site. And to basically, because of the high CSF pressure, CSF will move out, will take it into the test tube and you examine that fluid. This is a normal picture. Okay, uh, the fluid that comes out is basically clear and colorless. There are zero to three lymphocytes per cubic millimeter. Normally, no proteins or very minor amount of proteins can be present. This is the normal amount of chloride. And uh, a bit of mucus is present. So the normally the CSF is basically clear in color and the pressure is around 7200 milliliters of water. These are pathologies and the changes that would occur in CSF. During encephalitis, the color remains clear, pressure remains high, it's a brain abscess, then the patient's mind become cloudy and the pressure increases very much. Why? Because of the white cells or debris which will occlude the Economical eye and the prevent the outflow, hence, brain is a self swelling through a pressure. The brain tumor, you might find blood cells, and the appearance might be red or bloody in color. Pressure will be again raised, cause being the red blood cells from cooling the economical eye. That's one of the reasons for the colitis. Then again, the appearance of the CSS will be clear, or it will be yellow with raised CSS pressure. We've already discussed the pressure. Of CSF, first of all, we make the person feel as matter of fact, you usually ask the person to lie down so that the pressure you know, it equates in the whole spinal canal and the brain. To the nine, the pressure is about 130 millimeters of water, and this regulator of CSF pressure is basically the erythroid villa. Why just the erythroid villa? Because the amount of production is usually constant by the coronary plexus. So constant amount of CSF is being formed by the coronary plexus, but the amount of drainage or absorption by the coronary plexus, they can that can make means the regulation practice usually by the coronary villi. Causes of elevated CSF pressure, some of the qualities could be a tumor that can obstruct the outflow, hemorrhage and infection, hemorrhage may red blood cell can block the retinoid villi and debris or white blood cells can block the villi. In infections, or it could be a congenital hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus means increase in the brain, uh, in the brain world cavity, 
in congenital abnormalities, there is usually unusual or narrowing of the forelimbs. Raised sister pressure, it can be either diagnosed on spinal tap or by thumoscopy, okay, in which you basically observe the retina of the eye, and this would give off a characteristic sign of pepin edema, that is, swollen or edematous of the disc. Finally, hydrocephalus, 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 is of two types. Communicating, example shown in red, non communicating, example shown in blue. But in the case of communicating, non communicating, it's very uh, clear from the names. A non communicating hydrocephalus is due to obstruction within the foramen or the wind, something goes on in the ventricles, within which the CSF is not flowing freely from the ventricles to the cervical nerve space. It is such a pathology we refer to it as non communicating. In a communicated hydrocephalus, there's no error in the ventricles or the foramen. There's a free flowing CSF from these sites, but the error could be at the exiting points, whether it's the southern canal space or the other canal vitella. Such pathology can refer to as communicated pathology. This wraps up our presentation.